but really we're inspired by none other than the great Mr. Charlie Munger when he said, I think that a life properly lived is just to learn, learn, learn all the time. And that's what tonight's all about. So in fact, disclaimer, the information contained in this panel is of general nature and is provided for investor education only. No comments constitute investment advice or sales. Had to say it. Our first session, I'm gonna invite um, Mr. Jeff Gannon and Mr. Sri Viswanathan and Mr. Jacob McDonough, our moderator, up onto the stage. And um, we're going to talk about, have we been here before? History's lessons for today's markets. Good evening. I'm Jacob McDonough. I'm an investor from Grand Rapids, Michigan. And when Willow Oak asked me to uh, moderate tonight, I was excited because I'm a, a big fan of the, the fund managers up here. I assume most of you are too, and that's why you're in the room. Um, if you're unfamiliar with them, I definitely recommend researching them after this meeting. Uh, Shree recently was on a good podcast, uh, Best Anchor Stocks, I believe it's called. You can check that out on YouTube. And Jeff and Andrew Kuhn do the Focus Compounding podcast. So go check that out if you're um, a little unfamiliar. Um, but starting on that note, uh, Jeff, I wanted to ask you, um, I believe you've been writing publicly, uh, like on a blog, since you were maybe a teenager, at least close to it. And so by now, I think the pages stretch over 3,000 3, pages. You do the podcast that I mentioned. And so I just was curious about your journey and why you decided to learn so publicly, uh, share your knowledge publicly. I know I've learned a lot over the years. I'm just curious if you could talk about that journey. Um, well, I, I dropped out of college and started blogging just to have something to do all day. Because, you know, um, so it, it, there was no way to make money off of it or anything uh, getting started. But it was just I was already into investing. I had been for years picking my own stocks since um, I started in high school. And uh, so it was something to do, and I really enjoyed writing. And uh, it was an exciting time. This was 2005. Uh, it was pretty hard to put together a podcast. I put together a podcast which is very amateurish compared to what we have now. But uh, that was a new concept, and I had to get, like, podcasting for dummies or something, you know, um, because there weren't many podcasts. There weren't even many blogs, and there were very, very few investing blogs back then. Yeah, interesting. And I'm just curious, to this day, does writing still affect your investment process, either what you write publicly or privately? Is that part of your investment process? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it's the best way to know if you want to buy a stock or not. Um, I even have written some things that I've decided not to publish. I've written them mostly for myself, and then I liked the idea, and I felt it was too small, and it would cause a problem if I, I published it, um, competition for buying it, you know. But it's still, so it's purely the work of doing it that actually helps. Um, so I'll even do it in cases where I, you know, it's not for publication. And Sri, you and I were talking, and, and you made the good point that a lot of great investors that also happen to be good writers, like the Buffett Letters, uh, Peter Lynch has some good books out, and Joel Greenblatt. There just seems to be some, some correlation. I'm just curious if writing affects your uh, investment process and if you've worked on that over time as well. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thank you for uh, having me here. Thanks to Willow Oak and you. Um, you know, years ago, I uh, stumbled onto this uh, Peter Lynch book where he said the most important organ that you need for investing is guts, not brains. And so I was like, okay, this I can handle. And a few years later, I stumbled on this uh, paper by one Mr. Mark Sellers. Mark Sellers was giving a speech at Harvard and uh, he said, 95% of you are not going to make it in investing because the most important aspect of investing is the craft of writing. So that sort of stuck with me, and uh, I've always tried to focus on improving the quality of writing. And it's an integral part of how I think. I don't publish as much as uh, Gannon. I've been a big fan. I've been a big follower of Jeff's for a number of years. But uh, I do write. Some I publish. Many I don't. Yeah, great. And I know you both read quite a bit, and the topic today is is history and, and have we been here before. And, and I'm just curious about, um, not just at, at this time, but throughout your whole investing process, how much history and studying history and reading history, not just current write-ups, plays in your investment process. Sri, I'm just curious uh, for, to hear about that. Yeah, it's, uh, history is an integral part of uh, um, investing analysis. In fact, if you take a step back, you know, Harry Truman, he said, uh, 
there is nothing new in this world except the history that we do not know. And uh, you know, as far as investing uh, uh, analysis is concerned, what are we uh, interested in? We're interested in businesses that we think are going to produce a better return relative to the capital that we are putting at risk today, which means we're going to have to think about the future. Where do we get the his, you know, confidence for the future? It's the history. So it's the long history of 10 plus years, 20 plus years, depending upon the history of the company. And so uh, at a company analysis level, history is an important aspect. And uh, it also helps in um, analyzing the quality of the management team, you know, how the history of the company has evolved over time, how the management team, current or previous, have sort of performed over time. So history is an integral aspect. Yeah, and Jeff, I would ask you the same question. I know especially on the podcast I hear, uh, uh, you know, you bring up, you put the current period in historical, con uh, <coughs> excuse me, context. And I'm just curious if, um, you know, how you're able to draw that so quickly and if that's part of your investment process, you know, studying history and seeing if we've uh, been here before. Yeah, I think it's most useful for situations where we've forgotten that we're in potentially unusual times or to remember certain outliers and things like that. So um, I know we talked to some uh, bank management, for instance, um, uh, around the time of COVID or before then, and you know they would say that banks fail for credit reasons only, not asset liability mismatches, right? And that's like 99% of the banks that failed before, say the the early 80s and earlier were for that reason maybe. But throughout an earlier period, a generation ago, some did fail for the reason we saw these most recent ones failing. So if your period you're looking at is maybe you think, oh, 30 years is enough, it's enough for most normal observations, but it's not enough for certain outliers. Yeah, and that's interesting. Bringing up banking, I know today um, Buffett brought up how um, uh, if the laws didn't change, he said they might have major uh, major banking operations that maybe rival or exceed the insurance operations they have today. And I'm just curious, um, like Jeff, I know you talk about banking, I like to analyze banking, and I'm just curious if the um, if you have any comment on like the current banking environment, if that's changed anything, and how you look or, or analyze banks. I know. Um, Banks have been through rising rate environments, and they've been through this uh, before, but I'm just curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, higher rates are better for most banks, but the period where the rates are rising and the repricing, many do not reprice as quickly, so uh, they would need things to level out or come down a bit before you see better results. And uh, what Buffett's talking about, I mean, because you wrote a book that covers the bank, the Rockford Bank that they had, um, but... That bank, the way it was operated, and also how they operated the savings and loan that they ended up owning, is very different from how most banks operated. Uh, the savings and loan, they basically um, got rid of a lot of their deposits on that one because they didn't want to be in certain assets, and they really turned into a holding company to do totally different things, right? And a lot of savings and loans did fail that did the conventional things. So both of the banks that they owned, uh, they did very unconventional things on the asset side. And what Buffett always talks about is the making these mistakes on the asset sides. And all the banks we've seen that have failed, they could have had the deposits come in and kept in short-term money or something, but they either made uh, long-term fixed mortgages or they bought long-term fixed securities. And so it was a dumb thing on the asset side, even though it was a, a dumb credit thing. Interesting, interesting. And, and Shri, I know you have an interesting background in... Uh, I believe you worked in, in the real estate sector, insurance, uh, banking. I'm just curious if that's played a role in what industries you look at, whether uh, you learned a lot where you like those industries or maybe being inside of them and made you a little more wary. I'm just curious if you'd want to talk about uh, that background. Sure. Yeah, I spent uh, a number of years as uh, an investment banker and then as a corporate development executive doing deals and then ran a small financial services-focused fund. Um, you know, I, I want to sort of uh, digress a little bit. You know, there was a gentleman by the name of Thomas Phelps who wrote this fantastic book called 100 to 1 in the Stock Market. Now, he said, uh, good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. So I came, I came into this uh, business of running SVN Capital with that experience. Um, a lot of uh, exposure to interest rate sensitive sectors, real estate, banks, um, insurance companies. And in fact, when I launched SVN Capital, I did have some 
um, exposure to that rate sensitive area. I've evolved over time and today it hurts me to say that and sitting right next to this uh, master of bank investor, I probably will never invest in a bank again. That's good. Yeah, it's not for everybody there. Um, but like you mentioned, you work, you have worked at large firms with uh, large AUM and I assume lots of employees and maybe lots of red tape. I'm just curious how it's been going off and, and running your own fund and kind of being on that entrepreneurial journey compared to uh, uh, past firms. Yeah, this is a phenomenal experience. My only regret is uh, I didn't start this earlier. I've been doing SVN Capital over the last uh, four plus years now. And um, having worked for all these big institutions, have gained a lot of experience. Uh, it's a lot of fun to manage the time according to my schedule, the type of companies I'm interested in, the type of people I want to hang out with, and uh, management teams I want to be associated with. But of course, the biggest challenge in any emerging uh, manager kind of a situation is uh, uh, you know, growing the asset base. That is still an ongoing exercise for me. And uh, in fact, uh, you know, I remember uh, reading Mark Andreessen's comment recently. He said, uh, in any emerging uh, uh, sort of a company, there are only two major emotions that, uh, will, you know, com that one will come across. Um, complete euphoria or utter panic. I go through this every day. That's great. Um, and uh, just speaking about Berkshire, uh, since we had the meeting today, um, uh, switching topics, I think I'd be interested to hear if there's any subsidiaries they own. Uh, if you had to pick one to buy and hold, uh, each of you, I'd, like, I'd be curious your answer. If there was one other subsidiaries you could have, but you had to, to keep it, which would you pick? I'll let him go first. I mean, if I had to keep it forever, probably Seize Candies. If I could sell it eventually, probably Geico. And why's that? Well, Geico, I'm not sure about. Uh, you know, I, I don't know with, with self-driving eventually if that could cause there to be so little need for premiums for for auto that the industry could just become a tiny, tiny fraction, uh, you know, of what it is, and that would ruin that investment. Um, but I think it wouldn't happen for a really long time, and you'd have good returns in between. Um, and Seas Candies, uh, I think that you know it. It doesn't require capital. Um, it can price pretty well. And all the returns that you've seen is in a period where chocolate consumption for like box candy is down or flat. And so this return is pretty amazing considering it's in a time when the industry has not grown at all since the day they bought it. And Shree, before I get your answer, Jeff, once you have C's candy, can you expand it east? I know they've always been west coast. No. Can we finally get C's on the no. east coast and maybe internationally? No. What's your plan for expansion? No, you can't. I mean, I, I shop at Nebraska Furniture Mart of Texas. It's right by where I live. And uh, they have a C's candies there. Uh, I'll eat C's candies. I'll ship C's candies to people. They'll love it. It just won't do anything for it as a brand the same way. It's a high quality product, but it's not a, a brand that means anything anywhere else. And, and Shree, how about you? Which, which subsidiary would you own fully if you had to hold it? Yeah, I, I should have gone first since you gave me the option. I would have picked Seas Candies too. <laughs> yeah, that's a good answer. Um, okay. Um, and one thing that's kind of a passion of mine, and, and uh, Berkshire the company and Berkshire the structure I'm a big fan of. And I'm just curious if, um, if you think that uh, someone could replicate that and have success or if that needs kind of the singular... Uh, Warren Buffett person kind of running the show. Um, Shri, I mean, you've had some experience uh, inside some, some companies in the financial sector. Do you think the Berkshire structure could be replicated uh, to the degree Buffett's done it? That's a tough question to answer. Um, in reality, uh, many of my friends will say that, uh, yes, it can be replicated. It is being replicated, for example, in Sweden. Uh, Sweden has this uh, unique collection of serial acquirers who have been exceptionally successful. I've been looking at them. I don't own them. And, of course, we have this master of uh, serial acquirer up north in Canada, Constellation Software. Uh, but I constantly worry about, uh, you know, trying to come up with another Warren Buffett or Jeff Bezos or, you know, there are only one of those types of individuals. So 
Uh, for me, those types of uh, roll-ups are not necessarily within my wheelhouse, so I do stay away from them, but I keep looking. I have Swedish friends. I met them last night. Probably there are a couple of them here. They keep talking about uh, Swedish roll-ups, which seem to be replicating what Buffett is doing. Yeah. And I want to ask you about investing internationally, but first, Jeff, I'm just curious about your take on that question, too, on the, the Berkshire structure, if it can be replicated and uh, uh, with another one leading the charge. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it can be replicated, but I think people can look at it backwards now and think, okay, let me buy an insurance company, let me do these things. Buffett said if we could have kept the bank, we might have been as big in banking as we were in insurance. Um, he was flexible. So the reason he did what he did is because he could take capital out of textiles and the returns were terrible. So I think you can do it flexibly, but there'll be times where it doesn't make sense in insurance. It doesn't make sense in some other way to get the capital. But the idea of having float, the idea of reallocating capital from worse businesses into better ones, uh, owning businesses for that reason of shifting where the capital is, I think that can work, but just copying exactly what he did, he, I don't think he'd do the same thing today. If he, He'd have to go back to 1970 for what he did to make the same amount of sense as, as it would now. You know? Yeah, I think copying someone, you have to be careful because you have to be yourself and let your own personality shine through. And like you said, at different times, there's different opportunities, so you just have to look what's available there uh, today. But Shri, you brought up uh, uh, Sweden, and I know you do look internationally. Uh, so can you just talk about... Um, your process doing that? Is there a different investment process versus maybe a uh, business that's next door to where you live? Um, talk about your experience internationally investing. Yeah, so uh, currently about 50% of the portfolio is outside the US. It's a very fairly concentrated portfolio of just nine names. Um, the uh, investment uh, objective is still the same, is exactly the same, and uh, I'm looking for a positive answer to four questions. Is it a business that I can understand? Is it a high quality business? There is some quantitative analysis involved in that high quality. Is it a business owned by um, you know, honest, competent management teams? And is it available at a reasonable valuation? So those are the four questions and I'm trying to get a positive answer to all those four, irrespective of where the company is located, where the company is uh, doing its business. So. Um, Recently, um, on that point, there was actually a book released, Global Outperformers. I'm not sure if you've read that. Uh, the book is about 1,000% uh, plus performers over the last, I don't know how many number of years, but across the globe. And of course, the top five countries are you know, United States and China and Japan. The other two are sort of, sort of surprising uh, entries. One is India, and the other one is Sweden. And, uh, and so, you know, there are lots of opportunities to uh, come up with uh, uh, multi-baggers, not just in the United States or Canada, but in many other countries. And so probably because of my background, I'm a little open to uh, uh, looking at country, countries outside. But when, I'm, when I say I'm global, I'm not necessarily interested in, say, Nigeria or Mongolia. Nothing wrong with them, but I don't have any edge in terms of those types of countries. I'm looking for countries that follow one of two accounting uh, regimes, either U.S. GAAP or IFRS. Well, IFRS, there are 110 countries that follow international financial reporting standards. And so I sort of overlay a couple of other constraints. The filings have to be in English, and uh, uh, local governance, IP laws, have to be something that I can appreciate. So I don't want to be in Venezuela or Cuba or things like that. So. As a result, I'm currently in the United States, Sweden, Poland, and France. Yeah, plenty of countries still under those, uh, those rules. But uh, Jeff, have you in uh, Focus Compounding started looking abroad, or are you still kind of focusing in the US uh, right now? Uh, so we do look abroad. Uh, I think we're buying one thing right now that's, that's outside the US. Uh, I thought it might be 50%. You know, uh, It's never happened so far for us. Uh, my idea was more overlooked uh, small stocks in the U.S. and that you could do bigger stocks, more liquid stocks in other countries because there's not as much attention to some of these smaller uh, markets there as in the U.S. But uh, for whatever reason, I haven't really done that. And um, I'm not sure why, 
because uh, I've um, historically had better returns in Japan and the UK than I have in the US. And that either means I'm being too selective maybe or, or lucky in those ones, but it could also mean that I should invest more in, uh, in other countries, that it might be easier sometimes for me to find things than I think in some other countries. And do each of you meet with management teams? And if so, do you have any interesting stories of things you learned that you wouldn't have found in the financials or maybe um, common questions you ask or things you look for when you do meet with management? Jeff, uh, I know you've visited some in the U.S. at least. Is that part of your normal process? Yeah, I mean, I think in almost every case I, I've met with management or talk, um, probably met with management. Um, uh, there, there's a case or two where we bought in before a meeting. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things about the personalities of the people involved usually. So you find out lots of um, sort of soft information about the relationships between the people, all the personalities involved, and how that's determined the capital allocation or the structure of why management is, uh, why the, the company's organized the way it is and stuff. Could be a couple of big personalities or, you know, whatever. But it often is a lot less rational uh, than you might think think and uh, a lot of times the information that you find on message boards and whatever things about guesses as to why things are the way they are you realize are not the case and that it's people issues you know interesting and Sri do you visit ma with management teams is that part of your investment process yeah absolutely and uh, in fact uh, uh, most of the time I try to meet them before I actually start building a position but sometimes it so happens that uh, you know, timings may not work out well but uh, yeah, invariably, I meet the management team. There's a lot to be learned. Um, I've made, you know, I told you about my uh, uh, experience, you know, bad judgment and experience. I actually had a face-to-face -face meeting with a bank management team, and he told me something absolutely uh, untrue. And um, I was able to pick up the data, but I did not still make the move on my portfolio in spite of learning it. But uh, meeting management teams, you know, learning from their body language, um, not just once, but over, a dif over different settings and different time periods, I think that helps. Um, and you bring up there uh, maybe some red flags. Is there, is there red flags or, or things you stay away from that you um, may be signs when you're studying a company that is a deal breaker? I know... I guess you already talked about you stay away from cer certain uh, industries now, but um, I'm just curious if there's other red flags, um, things uh, investors could be could be wary of or look out for when when researching a company. Yeah, with respect to uh, you know management related red flags, uh, the more important ones would be compensation issues, incentives, and compensation issues. I've looked at a U.S. med tech company, for example, phenomenal performer. But uh, the incentives were based on purely top line revenue. Um, uh, you know, the senior management team gets paid if the revenue was about 36 percent or something. It, and so uh, it was a med tech company performing well, attractive valuation, uh, good ownership interest. It met all my criteria, but except when uh, I started at, uh, looking at the proxy and talking to the IR team about this specific issue wasn't necessarily comfortable with it. So most of the time I find red flags in incentives and compensation issues. And Jeff, how about you? Uh, same question. Any red flags you could warn people to kind of... I mean, uh, in general, red flags, uh, why are they listed in the country they're listed in? Um, so they're domiciled one place, listed in another. Is a big, can be a big red flag unless they understand why they're doing that. Why are they incorporated in some place unusual? Usually their home state or Delaware would be the logical ones. Other places, you want to know why they're doing that. Um, uh, using an accountant, that's unusual. It would make sense that they should be using an accounting firm that's near them in some way and that has enough people that could supervise them and is this kind of accounting firm that others their size normally use and especially that they're not the only firm in that, uh, they're not the only public firm in that industry or something, that accountant um, you know, uh, audits. Um, so, you know, a bunch of banks in one part of the country usually are mostly being audited by someone who audits a lot of banks. Not, you shouldn't be the only bank being audited by a firm that doesn't normally do that. Um, so those are the ones without meeting with management and stuff. Uh, in terms of management, promotional management, that's that's seems overly interesting in how you're reacting to what they're telling you. They're, they're doing too good of a job of selling you, and especially management that has a poor grasp of... Uh, the granular stuff about the business. 
they are very happy talking to you in generalities and, and things like that. But when they get a specific question, they kind of direct it to more of a, a talking point. Um, you know, it maybe it's possible people down in the company know those things and they don't, but that's a little worrying. Jeff, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I've heard you talk about uh, Nevada domicile companies. Yes. Maybe uh, you want to mention that too? Yeah, so, and, and we've invested in companies that, that are um, domiciled in, in Nevada, but uh, the reason for doing that is usually, uh, unless you're a really old California company, some of them did it, but other than that is usually because it offers better protection against, uh, for you against fraud in the case of fraud. It's harder to um, have personal liability issues, personal criminal issues, things like that, there than you're going to have in, in other places. So it's more likely that the company could get in a lot of trouble and you as an officer will not. Um, so that is worrying, especially if a company moves there from somewhere else. Why did they do that? Um, you know, It's certainly a popular place for people setting those things up. Now, like I said, we've invested in ones that have done that. And the truth is the reason they did it originally was exactly what I'm saying. But then a clean management came and pushed them out, and they never re-domiciled, which is not unusual. It's not unusual for the companies to not want to spend too much money, time, effort to switch to a, a better place that way or to switch auditors or whatever. It's the switch in the first place that's concerning. The, the status quo thing is not so much concerning. And maybe switching gears to the opposite then, um, positive things you look for. And I don't want to name any names in your current portfolio, but either past names you could talk about that um, was kind of a, a model of exactly what you look for now, or even if you don't want to name names from the past, um, maybe some uh, success stories of uh, businesses you've come across um, that maybe affected your thinking on what you look for today. Uh, could be past names in your portfolio or even uh, uh, just historical companies too. I'm curious if you guys have any thoughts there. Yeah, I'll go first. Um and I don't mind talking about one of my portfolio companies, Copart. I'm sure there are a few here. I know, Jeff, you have looked at Copart as well. There are lots of things to like about Copart. Um, uh, you know, instead of defining and describing the business here in terms of answering your specific question, you know, most of the time, the qualitative aspects of the business don't necessarily get reflected in the balance sheet or income statement. It needs some digging. So this is, uh, I'd say there are few different qualitative factors that sort of should appeal to investors looking at this company. Um, decisions made over a long stretch of time. So for example, the founder, Willis Johnson, back in 1993, he decided to essentially own the land on which these salvage yards operate. Um, and today, they have more than 8,000 acres of raw land. In fact, about uh, two years ago, a JP Morgan analyst got on the call and asked if um, you know, Copart would think about monetizing piece of those piece of those uh, of that salvage yard, and Jeff Liao, the CEO at that point, said, uh, "Absolutely not. We are looking to add more to land." So that ownership of land has actually translated into significant positive. Um, in fact, during the inflationary you know run up that we've had, it's been a big support. Number two, the uh, son-in-law, who's the co-CEO now, uh, Jay Adair. He made a decision in 2003 to actually transfer the entire um, auction process to online. And uh, as a result, it's been a phenomenal operating leverage story. And then that essentially translated into a significant positive during COVID. So these types of qualitative features are not necessarily evident in you know, the financials uh, right off the bat. But once you start digging in, you can appreciate um, the significance of the quality of the management team. You know, was that met with a lot of skepticism? It's a, a junkyard, right? And they went online and, and kind of sounds like did some innovation and stuff. I assume at the time that was maybe a little shocking to, um, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing they're not based out of Silicon Valley and they still were able to innovate? Yeah, they were actually based in Northern California. And at that time, they moved their base to Dallas. That's where they are now. But uh, uh, I didn't own the stock in 2003. Uh, I did analyze and miss it in 2009. I came back to own it in 2020. But uh, uh, must have been a surprise. Um, but again, you know, uh, back to one of your earlier questions about the history. 
if you go back in history and look at the operating performance over time and the decisions made over time, you can then appreciate the uh, uh, nodes at which these decisions happened. So you looked at it in 2003, invested in 2020. So that takes a lot of patience, right? I mean, uh, what was that like when you uh, finally jumped in after all those years of studying it? I didn't invest in, two, I didn't look at it in 2003, but in 2009, 2009, as you know, was a real estate centric financial crisis. So my analysis at that point was I was trying to put a value on real estate and I was trying to make an argument that the company, uh, the market cap at which it was trading was uh, essentially uh, uh, addressed by just the real estate value alone and you were getting the operations for free. I couldn't make that argument and so I moved on. Looking back, that analysis was wrong. Uh, obviously, I you know stood on the sidelines, watched it all run up. But uh, again, today you know it is the only publicly traded um, salvage yard company. The other competitor has been acquired by Ritchie Brothers, and so uh, um, it's the strongest performer with the biggest market share on a global scale. And uh, these decisions are still continuing to play out, and a lot more room for them to execute. Yeah, that's a really interesting example because I know if you look at Buffett's history, there's some stocks that he studied for, for decades and maybe to his younger years and finally pulls the trigger. So I assume there's some comfort there when you uh, have been familiar and done some work for a number of years and finally can, uh, can jump in. Unfortunately, not all companies have those 11, 12-year due diligence history. Yeah. And Jeff, I'm just curious about the same thing. Um, um, instead of red flags, maybe on the more, more positive note, any companies from the past... Uh, that come to mind similarly? Yeah, I mean, doing things that are uh, unorthodox, um, that are painful uh, decisions, capital allocation decisions or whatever. Um, obviously, usually it's, it, you can report better numbers if you lease instead of owning things. If you, you know, so what are they doing that might hurt their results? Um, you know, there are some industries where all the grocery companies in it, you'll notice, use FIFO accounting, and all the older ones use LIFO. Um, the, the ones using FIFO are paying more for their taxes just so that they can report better earnings per share to you. Um, so I think, you know, we talked about banks, right? Banks that sold some available for sale securities a few quarters ago, right? Banks that, that went out and got money that's a little more expensive but prepared them for a few more years. It may not make a huge difference, but it shows that there's a willingness to, to take the trade off with they have to take an immediate hit to earnings to do that. And some don't want to do that, right? Um, and playing that game. We, when you were talking about Copart in the, in the book, uh, Junk to Gold, which is a great book about that company, um, the, the founder was talking about how he had to learn that Wall Street hated when the company grew really fast and then it slowed down. Then either, you know, everyone told him, okay, you got to grow more at the same speed for them, right? You, gotta, they can't, you can't do it this way. And that sort of thing of getting into that game is dangerous, right? So I think that any time, it takes a lot of willpower uh, to go against those things and to say, no, we're going to make the right decision, even if it hurts our earnings a little bit. And, um, you know, a few years back, it was paying special dividends, right? Companies would do that. That's not something you get a lot of credit for, but it made sense from a tax thing to do it. That would be a good list to look at it. Here's companies willing to do unorthodox things that they just think make sense. Yeah, I think it's Tom Russo. I think his quote, uh, I've heard him talk about quite a bit, is the capacity to suffer. And it sounds like that. And I know Berkshire has plenty of examples like that, but the Rockford Bank comes to mind where um, when they bought them, they were very, very liquid and um, very unleveraged. And so they had good returns on capital, but that was only because they were so efficient and so low cost. They could still earn good returns on capital while being very, very conservative. Um, but they obviously could have had great returns on capital uh, if they wanted to push their leverage even to uh, not, not too extreme, but even just push it a little bit. Uh, so Berkshire proves time and time again they have the uh, capacity to suffer. So I can see that's very important. Uh, but you do need a good shareholder base, I assume, or at least a management team uh, with a lot of control or just a strong personality to, able to have the capacity to suffer. Uh, is that something you look for? Do you look at, like, the shareholder base or, I mean, maybe just get to know the management team to know if they have that capacity? Um, either of you, if you want to talk about that, what you look for when you're uh, – do you look at the shareholder base? Yeah, so one of the first questions we always ask a company is what's their shareholder composition like, right? 
Um, that helps a few ways. It helps get a conversation going with us because we may be very alien to them, this value investing concept and, and all of that. Um, and sometimes they're pretty open about that. We own stock in some company that's told us, you know, here's, yeah, you're talking like my American investors talk, but my, my UK investors never say that. The Americans and the Canadians, they're the ones who talk to me about the buybacks. These people talk to me about the dividends. These people talk to me about, you know, the book value. They said, oh, we've got value investors like you in there. They're always talking about the tangible book value, you know. So uh, they do get that based on what the shareholder uh, composition is. And um, sometimes they're talking to us, they actually would be like, how do I get the word out there and attract different, you know, um, it, it, more action in my stock, basically, they're saying. And sometimes you want to explain, you know, there's different kinds of investors out there, and you might want to think about who you want to attract. and what, You can only have one story to tell, and it's not going to appeal to everybody, you know. Uh, Shri, do you have any thoughts on that, too? Yeah, I do take a look at uh, the shareholder base. I mean, obviously, it's one of my investment criteria to have good insider ownership. Apart from that, I look at the, you know, the, av the median market cap of my portfolio is about $20 billion. So these are relatively large companies. In the U.S., they're somewhat dominated by these passive investors. But outside the U.S., um, I get a slew of different types of um, investor base. Uh, but when I meet with these management teams, particularly over the last couple of years, I've actually handed out Dr. Lawrence Cunningham's books, uh, Quality Investor and Quality Shareholder, to them to actually uh, communicate in a manner that would attract a specific type of investor base. And so it's likely to play out over the next uh, few years. We'll see. But um, it's a kind of a different story outside the U.S. You said on average $20 billion market cap. So I assume you're not going to take any activist positions too soon or, or major stakes. But, uh, Jeff, I know you talked about small overlooked stocks, at least in the U.S. And I'm just curious, as the fund grows, would you be comfortable or would you look at uh, either activists or, if not activists, um, maybe a better word is uh, just large stakes in companies, even if it's going to be a passive stake? Or if not, do you have to kind of scale up the companies you're looking at overseas where larger companies are more overlooked? Uh, how do you think about that? Yeah, so it's a concern. So uh, and I mentioned there's a case where we didn't meet with management ahead of time. Uh, the reason is we didn't want to spook them. We were going to buy a lot of their stock. And uh, uh, some companies would be very concerned if you bought a lot of their stock quickly, if you became like a double-digit percentage holder. Um, we bought stock in blocks from activists at one time, specifically to be a more friendly uh, holder of the stock. We thought that could help. Um, so... It's something that we're willing to do. Um, on, it's something we may be dragged into at times, uh, specifically because in these very small stocks, there are not passive holders. And so people get shareholder lists and realize that we're a very large percentage, even in ones people don't see us filing on and stuff. We're actually one of the larger shareholders in terms of votes. Uh, and votes are, could be pretty seriously contested in cases where everyone will be voting without uh, these proxy advisory firms and, and that sort of thing. So um, it, it's not something we would want to do, really, but uh, we, we do get calls from people and stuff. Um, yeah. Okay. And one last question for me. Um, I'm just curious, uh, for you personally and for the fund, what does success look like or an end goal? Uh, what, what do you see for the future? Um, Shree, I'm curious if you could answer that one. Yeah, my primary focus is to uh, put up healthy returns. My objective is to double the capital over a business cycle. So as long as I can continue to keep pace with that objective, that would be my uh, uh, end goal. In terms of uh, um, assets in the management, I'm still growing. Um, far away from actually calling it closed. But my primary objective is to put up the returns. And Jeff, how about you? Yeah, I mean, we, we just finished our annual fund report thing, and I had them strike out a line about relative performance or something to say strong absolute performance. Um, so same idea. That's the thing, long-term um, strong absolute performance. But success would be still being in business after a long period of time. You know, this is meant to be a pretty permanent vehicle for me. It's the only way I invest. Don't hold anything outside of it. So it's not an idea that there'll be any other um, 
periods of my career or something in terms of investing money, this is meant to be the vehicle to, to have it continue. So, um, yeah, in terms of assets and management stuff, I'm afraid of, like, filing 13Fs and all that kind of stuff. So that's sort of the soft cap there. But if you hold a lot of unlisted securities foreign, that's not necessarily an issue until you get really big. So, um, But as long as it's still not everybody knows what we hold, then I think it can scale up, yeah. Great. Well, thank you for your time. I had a lot of fun. Uh, Yeah, thanks again. Thank you.